Now, let's go hunting, Dada, said Tommy. Well, Tommy, Air Chief Silverway may not have been alive to see that day, Tata continued, but on October 1st, 2017, the province of Nova Scotia and the Crown, Crown made a public apology to the Grand Chief's family and granted him a free pardon. His oldest grandson, my friend George Silverway, accepted the apology on behalf of all of his descendants and the rest of the Mi'kmaq. So Grand Chief Silverway was right all along, Tommy proclaimed. I sure wish I could have thanked our Grand Chief Silverboy for all he had done for us. Here's the picture that was done by Gerald Glode, our illustrator for all three books. in the picture. Dada was proud of his grandson's respectful words for the Grand Chief. You can show your thanks to him, Tommy, Dada said, smiling. But how, Dada, since he is no longer living, asked Tommy. You can exercise and respect your right to hunt and trap for your survival, and never forget the people who fought for our treaty, said Dada. I will, Dada, promised Tommy. Now, Dada, hurry up, Tommy teased. We have a moose to hunt. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> so, um, these are our three books that were done by all of us, respectively. Respect. And um, before we, before, uh, once we were, once we kind of got our books back, we were also asked to uh, include four learning experiences, four lesson plans, my old, my old uh, age makes me call it lesson plans, but learning experiences to, uh, that we could use for each book. And um, I was getting really anxious right towards the time we were uh, going to make another presentation earlier in the year. So I asked one of our teachers, the grade six teachers, to share our book with her class and see if she could use any one of my lesson plans and, and see how they could, um, uh, or she could tweak it in any way. Anyways, I kept seeing her in the hallways and keep asking, kept asking her, um, have you have you read the book yet? Have you done anything yet? And she, you know, I asked her like about well, three times, and each time she would say, "Moha, me now, me, not yet." So, anyways, the, about the fourth time I asked her, I asked, her, I said, "Ah, I'm passing her in the hallways," and I asked her again, "Kis kawa kis ano me da kis kis gita me da we got again." And she uh, said, "Yes, oh my God, Caroline, you should have seen them. You should have seen them. You should have heard them. I couldn't get through the whole." lesson, I couldn't even get through the whole uh, book without them starting to talk about what was relatable to them, like um, the Hunter's Mountain, you know, Bottle de Gelta, all of these things that are in the book, they could all relate to them, and, and she said, I couldn't believe how much discussion started, she said, because normally they don't read it when usually, but when they were reading this, when I was reading it to them, we could, we could hardly get through the book. And um, in, in one of my, uh, I think it's the next one. So when we were looking at the learning experiences, when we were doing them, we tried, uh, all of us were trying to do the traditional ones. Of course, all of us know we have to meet outcomes in our grades, you know, with language arts. And, but when you do this book, you could reach like the science, the history, the geography, the language arts, even the health. You know, because all of these books, um, if you want to teach our people, have to touch on everything holistically, like the presenter said earlier. So when we looked at this, you know, I, I looked at traditional uh, doing a question answer, like doing developing vocabulary, doing written seat work, uh, individual and group, listening, speaking, and oral presentations. You know, I thought of that. But I put an emphasis on the non-traditional, which is the cultural activities, like the talking circles, the art of storytelling, the oral, the importance of oral tradition and how it's affected all of our history. You know, Maui Omiyo, smudging set, like all of this to be introduced and can be introduced using these, these books. Um, and even having cultural experts, you know, bringing your elders in and, and maybe they have a story that they would like to share. And, and I had one of the learning experience that I used um, for them to go back home and ask their parents 
what, uh, what stories that they have learned or remembered passed down from their parents. So they could also tap into the oral tradition themselves. Uh, I wrote that food for thought, what can you see in the slide? I was just like, while I was doing it, you know, you get that little aha moment. And I said, it's funny how traditional teaching, traditional teaching in the Western world includes like the question, answer, all this stuff, you know, like the, it, we've been colonized, our education has been so colonized that our traditional is actually seen as the non-traditional. So that should be changed. That should actually be called traditional, really, our learning there. So I, uh, with these books, here are the lists of things that, uh, what we could learn. Um, just to name a few, I don't wanna read all of them. I know my friends are coming up next soon. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, in one of the lessons, identify how Grand Chief Silvoy and his qualities as a leader to the Mi'kmaq helped him uh, fight for his hunting and fishing rights during the era of treaty denial. Um, I had a lesson uh, including all the seven sacred teachings. And with each seven sacred teaching, you could have a lesson in itself. So I had a grade four teacher who came back and she did the lesson that I did on uh, Grand Chief Silliboy and his qualities as a leader. And the children came back and they, they did pictures of their leaders. And um, I, I was so humbled because one of the children picked me and they drew me. So I said, oh my God, like all of this, this journey, this whole time during these books, it's been so incredible. Just hearing that um, our kids are relating to all of this information is, is, you know, that's why we do what we do, right, as teachers. So here is a very powerful picture. This picture is of George. George is the descendant of uh, the late grand chief Gabriel Sulaboy. He's his grandson. And uh, when I was showing my daughter this slide, because I you know, just thought it was such a powerful picture, she said, Mom, it's so confusing. Son of Simon was the son of Lake Grand. But that's, that's the lineage. Grand Chief Silliboy's son, Simon, had a son named George, who had a daughter named Darlene, who had a daughter named Allison. And this is Allison's daughter, Grace. And here, George is looking at the book and sees himself in the book um, because we have a picture that Gerald uh, did uh, in the book where George is standing by the premier. So which is, a, I, I just couldn't, uh, I had to include that in there. So if, uh, if any of you would like to see any of my lesson plans, there's only four of them, and I'm sure all of you guys can probably just run away with, with all of this stuff here. I'd be more than happy to share this with you. My lesson plans, the PowerPoint, I'll send you up, whatever you want. There's my uh, email. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> and um, I would be remiss if I didn't add this one thing. While we were reading, while, while we were on the journey of writing these books, um, when the women were talking about it this morning, they say how uh, the grandmother said, don't forget to pray, don't forget to pray before you're hunting, don't forget to, you know. Well, that's how I was taught. That's how I was taught, to acknowledge spirituality in your life. And while I was writing that book, I was, you know, praying to our creator and to the grand chief and saying, like, please, uh, so I asked the Grand Chief to give me the thoughts and the words and the emotions and the feelings to, to create, to create um, this work so that our children will be able to learn about him and our history in the future. And uh, another one here is just, just a little reminder Okay, one minute over. Uh, but I have to say this one. I have to read it, so I have to. An elder in his testimony to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission stated, the current education system has been designed to completely eradicate who I am. 
and to kill the Indian Mi'kmaq spirit that's in me. But I do know I need knowledge and I need education. But the kind of education I need has to be reflective of who I am as a Mi'kmaq. And that knowledge that I get, that I will receive, I have a responsibility with that knowledge to pass it down so others will benefit from it. The kind of legacy that I want to leave my children in the future generations is one which they will be able to excel. They will be able to compete without having to worry about is the education system going to further eradicate themselves? And that was a statement in his testimony uh, done by Albert Marshall, who is a, a, a <coughs> residential school survivor. And that's what motivates me, and I think should motivate all of us, so that when our children know themselves, know their culture, know their identity and where they come from, and, and their learning experiences are validated so that they don't feel like, yeah, we're going outside, that's not work, when really that may be the best lesson in their lives and they'll remember forever. We have to think about that each time when we're, trans when we're transferring this knowledge of ourselves and our culture to our kids. And if you, if you have a difficulty doing that, please don't be afraid to ask someone. Everybody gets it just ask someone. That's that's how we get all the information we're getting. Malalio. Okay, so I have the honor of presenting Sheila Gould because I can be a person. <laughs> Sheila Gould is a Mi'kmaq from Eskasoni First Nation, and she teaches reading at Eskasoni Elementary Middle School. Sheila has been involved with Mi'kmaq language development for over 17 years. Currently, she helped make the Grand Chief series with the treaty education um, leaders. She is passionate about the retention of Mi'kmaq language and culture. Sheila believes the idea that language means culture, and culture is language. Together, they develop and influence each other in the educational resources that they develop. So let's welcome Sheila. Well, uh, I brought a drum that I made uh, with Clark Paul. And uh, when I, this is a really hard drum to make because you know the most high is slippery and there's like, you really have to kind of, really have a lot of strength to build that drum. And then it took around two days for it to dry. And then once it, once it dried, I just did like the sound. To me, since I made this drum, it's it's a beautiful sound, and uh, so I encourage people to kind of get that experience. And then, in introducing uh, my my book, or I would like someone to um, play the honor song before the book is taught just to have like a setting, just to um, uh, create a, a moment, uh, just to allow a child to use the drum and find a beat on their own. And that's why I just brought this drum. The Grand Chief series itself, uh, I'm not gonna read it, but I will tell you about the uh, some parts of it. Now, in the beginning, there's a family, a current modern family, getting ready to go to a baptism. Um, and then it starts uh, going back to over 400 years ago before um, newcomers came. Um, Gerald Blow did, a, did a beautiful drawings um, of how maybe my way of life was at one time. Um, 
the grandmother is speaking to Annie, and Annie's asking questions, and then it just goes like that in dialogue. Um, but um, yeah, the pictures are depicted beautifully. And the kids really like the pictures. Um, presentation. Yeah. I have like a 20 page slide or something, but I'm not going to go through all of it. So I'm going to give you an overview uh, and some of the learning experiences um, I developed with the Grand Chief Member Tool and the New Commons book. Okay. Continue. Now, Grand Chief Member Tool and the New Commons talks about the first relationship established between the Mi'kmaq people and French explorers over 400 years ago. This relationship has impacted the life of the Mi'kmaq since it developed. Many events since the continuous upholding of our treaty rights, the residential school era, the centralization, have had lasting effects on all people within Mi'kmaq, most specifically Mi'kmaq people. Mi'kmaq have maintained many traditional ways and beliefs and or blend the two faiths together. Um, on page 12 of the book, there's a strong theme on compassion. Okay, a compassion is a sacred teaching. Uh, and it shows when Grand Chief Member Two says, they are sick, hungry, and need our help to survive. We know what foods to eat, what medicines they need, and how to live off the land. He saw their pain and saved the explorers as a result. Now, uh, I included like a video of compassion uh, so that it can uh, relate to kids a little bit better. Um, uh, I explained what compassion was, uh, and I am hoping like students would, would notice when others are hurting, stop to help, take time to listen, do what they can be kind regardless. So that would be like the, um, the outcome for the lesson. Uh, there's a sheet on where you fill out what compassion is to you. And okay, that's good. Then there's a storyboard activity. Um, the uh, The storyboard is like this. So what I would do is like make make large photocopies of the kids and paste them on. Have teams make large photocopies of these and have a group like the team um, put the um, the events that happened in the story in sequential order so that they can remember what the story is and it would be like a good language arts activity. Okay. Then there would be like a question period of what um, some things you would want to ask Grand Chief Member to. Uh, then on page 12 again, it talks about sustainability. 
uh, not only do you do does the creator want us to have a good relationship with people they want us to have a good relationship with land so page 12 talks about that and then there's a video on sustainability as well. Can you click the next? Yes. So Dion's promise um, uh, is another YouTube video uh, that talks about sustainability. Uh, questions on sustainability. Um, the other theme in the book is Mi'kmaq ways and beliefs. And you can see it throughout the book, like the cultural elements, like there's uh, gatherings, there's uh, sharing, there's uh, you know dress, um, and then I think you know um, you can look at current uh, videos, like on powwow at powwows, and uh, do like a compare and contrast so people understand. Uh, how they are, like we're not, like it's depicted on in history books. Uh, there's a sheet you can fill out. Uh, learning another language shows respect for another culture. So I have included learning experience on Mi'kmaq greetings to do with your students. So that I only did the greetings because um, it's like a theme, and then. Uh, students will um, students can go into groups and um, say one of these like Busu. so there's like a phonetic uh, support for it and there's a word Busu. so students can work in teams to say these words and then uh, it's good to use the uh, greeting terms because you could use them all the time, anywhere. You just don't have to use them at home or use them at school. You could use them all the time. So there's Kusul, Happy Birthday, Muriajibuna, Daluisin, Deluisin, Dalia, um, and so on. Welaadi. Um, Extra lessons to build on. Uh, you could discuss how um, Mi'kmaq travel from place to place depending on the season. You can elaborate on that. Um, what they did in spring, summer, fall, and winter. Uh, how they prepared for each season. Ceremonies, traditions, hunting, gathering at those times. Uh, what did they use to hunt moose? What was the other one, Carolyn? Thank you. Berries and what they were used for. Um, on page 12 again, uh, we could talk about who the creator was and what that. Uh, uh, when we met with uh, grade four and six teachers, um, we asked for ideas. And some of the ideas they included were to have more land-based experiences from the uh, knowledge people as well as cultural experiences. Uh, and then I take I talked about my drum, but you know, make baskets, invite artisans, uh, teach about tools. Uh, they also wanted uh, a timeline of the history of grand chiefs, grand captains, captains and the women of St. Dan from all First Nation communities. And then look at the significance of ribbons and colors of the Grand Council, and somebody mentioned that that information can be found at Big Maginama. Uh, again, I'm talking about the drumming. And then there is a video called The Honor Song of the Mi'kmaq Sing Along um, on YouTube. So there's like a phonetic way of saying it as well as, uh, you know, the students can follow, learn to follow the true beat when they listen to that and uh, when they use the drum. Okay, we got to get the George Paul. Ah, yeah, yeah. And there's also a book uh, 
<laughs> okay, moving on to our last presenter, Star Paul, mother of seven children, ages 3 to 23 years. She is a teacher and a professor going on 21 years. Star has been teaching language all her life. Star completed a Master's of Education in Leadership at St. Francis Xavier University and did a thesis entitled, An Inquiry into the Mi'kmaq Immersion Program in One Community student identity, fluency, and achievement. This research was done with Cherise Paul Gould and was finished in 2012. Another research, she feels that there should be another research um, to be done soon. Star strives to keep our uh, Mi'kmaq language alive and she will continue to work hard in all avenues, as such as these treaty education books, the series, Grantee series, she has developed curriculum for language. STAR has been included in language revitalization groups such as EMILY, which is the Eskasone Numa Language Initiative, presented in numerous conferences, workshops, and in services. She's actually the one that kind of encouraged me not to be so nervous. <laughs> she won the Donald Marshall Senior Award and the Inspire Language and Cultural Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Star Paul. how to put this book together. I'm sorry about you and this and it was Um I don't have a PowerPoint. Um, these girls are really professional. They brought a PowerPoint, but I feel like uh, I'm just going to talk about the book and um, just like uh, what we've been doing uh, so far. Uh, these books, these three books, they are um, geared for uh, grades four to six. Uh, and the books that we started with, I think Sheila's is the first book, and that's for grade four. Uh, the next one is this one, uh, Grand Chief John Baptist Cope in Treaty of 1752. This is for grade five. And Caroline's book, The Grand Chief Gabriel Solo Boys for grade six. And so when we did our lesson plans, uh, we made them, you know, like step up a little bit more difficult for these students and, you know, for them to be thinking more about these things. And um, I want to read my book, Grand Chief John Baptist Cope. shared the books. Uh, he he um, distributed them. He has a lot more in his vehicle, so he said oh, what he could carry is what he brought. Um, I'm going to read my story. As Harry grabbed a ribbon shirt from his closet, he could hear his grandfather downstairs. He had arrived to take him to the Treaty Day March in Halifax. Since he was a little boy, Harry had gone to the march. He and his family stood together on the roadside, proudly watching as Donna walked with the other Miwa leaders. This year was extra special. Guiz 
You are old enough to march with me this year, Grandfather said. Harry smiled as he caught a glimpse of himself in the mirror, wearing the ribbon shirt his giju had made for him. Hurry up, Harry, his mom yelled from downstairs. In the car, Harry was getting a bit nervous. He wanted to make his grandfather proud. Dada, Harry began, what if someone asked me why I am marching today? What should I tell them? Dada paused and looked at his watch. I think we have time to take a quick detour to the government house before the church services begin. There's something I want to show you there, said Grandfather. Harry remembered at government house last year. He and Dada woke up really early to attend the ceremonial raising at the Mima flag. He wondered what his grandfather was going to show him. Harry and his grandfather arrived at government house. His grandfather led him down a very wide hall. Harry could hear the echo of their footsteps as he followed closely behind his grandfather. They stopped in front of a painting. Who's that, Dada? Harry asked. Once long ago, in the district known as Sibanegani, there was a Mi'kmaq grand chief named John Baptist Cope. He was a great hunter, a man of great courage, and his people trusted him, said Grandfather. At the same time in Europe, the Lord of Trades had instructed a man named Edward Cornwallis to sail to Port Royal. He was told to set up trade with the Mi'kmaq. Unfortunately, Cornwallis did not listen well, for he ended up sailing into Sibanegadi, hunting and fishing territory. This came as a huge surprise to Grand Chief Cope, stated Grandfather. So as when we were making these books, we were trying to envision what, what, what pictures would go nice with our um, story. So we're like, we should have a map and like, you know, have like the ship sailing from Europe and going down. And Gerald found like a really nice depiction of the um, map like a long time ago. Harry asked his grandfather, was the Grand Chief angry when they arrived? Grandfather replied, well, Greece, at first, Grand Chief Cope was confused. After all, this had always been a Mi'kmaq territory uh, or traditional district. Seeing new people suddenly arrive and build a fort puzzled him. Harry asked, then what happened? Well, Guise, Cornwallis said that we declared war on the British, said Grandfather. Harry asked, did we declare war on them? No, the Mi'kmaq were just asking why we're, while he was there and telling him that he never got permission to settle there from us, replied Grandfather. Grandfather added, you see, the Mi'kmaq at the time were a considerable fighting force, both by land and sea. In fact, in one year, the Mi'kmaq were able to capture more than 20 British ships. Harry said, wow, that's a lot, Dada. Grandfather said, yes. The Mi'kmaq were so skilled at protecting their homeland that Cornwallis had a nasty idea. He would pay others to kill the Mi'kmaq and then put a bounty or reward on the scalps of every Mi'kmaq man, woman, and child, said Grandfather. My scalp, yelled Harry as he grabbed his hair. Yes, but that was a long time ago, replied Grandfather. What happened to the Mi'kmaq next? Grandfather stated, well, many of the Mi'kmaq traveled to seek safety to a place called Unamagi, Cape Breton, for from the British soldiers. The Lord of Trades in Britain got so tired of all the war and the fact that they weren't making any money or, or trade. Cornwallis was, was finally replaced in 1752 with a new British commander named P.T. Hobson. Hobson wanted to create peace and sent a letter stating this to the Mi'kmaq. In the summer of 1752, a great meeting was held in Chapel Island, an annual gathering place for Mi'kmaq. At this time, they discussed peace or war, said Grandfather. What did they decide? asked Harry. 
After a long discussion, they said the way of peace, harmony, and trade were better than a life filled with war, violence, and fear, stated grandfather. Grandfather added, just think of how brave and courageous Grand Chief Cope was when he went back to Halifax to negotiate peace with a reward still on his scalp. He was uncertain of what would happen and wondered if this was all a trap. Was it a trap? Did they kill him? asked Harry. No, said Grandfather. The British listened, and because of that, they were able to create the peace and friendship. Thus, the Treaty of 1752 was made. Grandfather said, there are many promises within the 1752 treaty. Nima rights to hunt and fish were protected. Both groups lived peacefully, as was symbolized by the burying of the hatchet. The Mima also pledged to return British shipwrecks, which came with a reward. And finally, the Mima and the British promised to celebrate Treaty Day every year on the first day of October together. There's the burying of the hatchet. The Mima, So, we are here in Halifax because of the 1752 treaty, asked Harry. Yes, answered his grandfather, to renew peace and friendship each year. You see that painting? That is Grand Chief Donald Marshall Sr. In 1986, he declared October 1st to be celebrated annually as Treaty Day. Dada, thank you for bringing me here and telling me about Grand Chief John Baptist Cope, Harry said. Grandfather replied, thank you for listening. Someday you will carry on the story just as I learned from my grandfather when I was your age. And that's it. So a lot of these stories, um, oh, a lot of <laughs> <Magic day. laughs> A lot of these stories that we made, like really, there's a lot of history behind these uh, storybooks. Um, just recently, just this year, I moved to the high school, and um, you know, as soon as we finished these books, I said, "Geez, I gotta teach it to these high school students." I asked them, "Does anybody know John Baptist Cope?" They're like, "No," and I would ask them about the other grand chiefs, and they didn't know. So um, it was part of you know teaching them and. You know, it was history, and um, you know now if you ask them about these chiefs, they'll they'll they could tell you about these chiefs because um, they too enjoyed these stories, and um, like the girls said, they we have done lesson plans for these books. Um, we've uh, worked good together, and um, I was glad to be um, um, part of these presentations because you know. It's ongoing, and we have to work together, and you know we need feedback too as well. Like, um, like I said, hi Nigelo, Delari, get up, love, Bistul, look at that. We need to get more of those here. Yeah, and there's a lot of ten minutes. All right. Grand Chief Member Two and the newcomer. One Sunday morning, Annie's family was busy getting ready for Mass. Today, her younger sister was to be baptized. Her grandmother noticed the eye in Annie's face as she asked, Why are we baptized? Grandmother said, Well, Annie, for Mi'kmaq, it's a long story that goes back more than 400 years. Before any other people arrived on the shores of Mi'kmaq, the Mi'kmaq lived peacefully off the land as skilled hunters and gatherers. Wild game meat, fish, plants, and berries were plentiful, but the Mi'kmaq would only get what they needed to survive. 
Mi'kmaq traveled from place to place depending on the season. So there's like a historical um, part to that. Then one morning, a very, very long time ago, Grand Chief Member Two, a leader of the Mi'kmaq, spotted from a distance what appeared to be large trees floating toward the shore of Mi'kmaq. What did he see, Grandmother? asked Annie. Well, Annie, when the large ships, were, when the large trees got closer, Grandma, Grand Chief Member Two realized that they were actually large ships with people aboard. The people looked exhausted and spoke a language never heard in Mi'kmaq. Was Grand Chief Member Two scared? asked Annie. So it just kind of reminds you of like the land of Mi'kmaq. Um, I don't think so, Annie. Many people have said Grand Chief Member Two was over a hundred years old, very tall, wise, caring, and brave. He was well respected by all the Mi'kmaq, and that is why he was the Grand Chief. Were the other Mi'kmaq scared when they heard about the people on the large ships? And he asked. Many were scared and didn't want to go near them, said Grandmother. Grand Chief Member Two spoke about how he watched these men as they came to our shore. Grand Chief Member Two said, they are sick, hungry, and need our help to survive. We know what foods to eat, what medicines they need, and how to live off the land. We must live in harmony and friendship with the people and creatures that have been put here by the Creator. So there's a lot of cultural elements and knowledge given to the kids in the story. So Grand Chief Member Two took the new people, we call newcomers, under his wing. He learned that they were French and came from a country called France. Over the next several seasons, the two groups got to know each other better. Annie asked, how were they, how were they able to talk to each other? Grandmother answered, over the next several seasons, the Mi'kmaq and French learned from each other, shared music and dances, and shared different foods. Annie impatiently asked, what does this have to do with getting baptized? Well, many years passed. They learned each other's language, began telling their stories, and even spoke to their creation stories and beliefs, stated grandmother. Grand Chief Member Two listened to the French tell about their customs surrounding prayers and rituals. With much thought, Grand Chief Member Two decided to embrace French spirituality and was to be baptized along with his family. And so, in 1610, Grand Chief Member Two, along with members of his family, were baptized to show friendship, commitment, and, de and a deep spiritual connection to the newcomers. And he asked, when we are baptized, we honor and renew the relationship between the Mi'kmaq and the French? Yes, that's a big part of it, said Grandmother. Grand Chief Member Two was baptized in the Catholic faith, however, Mi'kmaq still reached still retain their own spirituality and traditional beliefs. Still today, many Mi'kmaq accept either one or the other or blend the two faiths in their daily life, said Grandmother. And then that's the end of the story. Thank you. Well, Ali, I'd like you to me next. I'm going to email my starpaul at eskasoniskool.ca. I'm going to email my girls in the bus of Twisin and Nala. Uh -huh. um, so then, double R. Double R. S T A R R P A U L. I guess it's only school. Um, I don't know. Any questions? Yes, Karen? How long did it take to write? How long did it take us, Jaime? About nine months, ten months? In the first draft, we had it within the first two weeks. After that, probably three to four months of editing. Well, you have to think that, you know, we made stories like Shiva made. We all brainstormed together about these stories of how, you know, we should uh, have these pictures depicted for each of the pages. And so um, when we did that, um, we brainstormed together, then we went and did our own storybooks. 
and then after we did that, we made we made the story, and then Jaime had to go back and um, give these books to uh, Jerome. So he had to illustrate that. That took a lot of time too, and you know, then they would come back to us, and you know, that story, that picture doesn't really go with what we wanted, and you know, so it was like uh, going back and forth. Uh, summertime, we really didn't touch it or anything. We had our summer break, so that's why it took a little bit longer. Start February last year. Start? I don't have I don't have a question. I just want to say how amazing it is that you are creating what you're creating because what you're doing is you're making new roads of real history, beautiful history towards the future of our young people that will never forget. Because many of our young people have forgotten what has happened in the past, but you are creating something new that's going to last forever and ever. And I thank you very much. Um, and I think this is just only the beginning, too. Like, you know, so, um, you know, um, uh, we already spoke about this um, when we had our last um, uh, professional development that we're going to think of stories of uh, uh, women in our history and you know and say stories about them and like Caroline said when they start talking inside the classroom just about you know these experiences then they went back and you know thought of their own personal experiences and you know that's what we need. We need for kids to um, make connections. Yes. Anyone? 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 We did, when we did the professional development day for the teachers, we gave out all the books, that, and we have only about a box left. <clears throat> but we plan to have everything available uh, online within the next month for anyone to download. But if people want physical copies, they have to talk to Giselle at our office, and she'll help order it. Giselle Stevens, a little bit MK. Website is the Onuizu Tinesh, her email is on the uh, Onuizu Tinesh website, Giselle Stevens. And this is. We had a professional development um, last Monday, and uh, we had a lot of um, teachers, Mima teachers, and we did distribute the books at the time. There was like a table full of all the books, and uh, they did take them. And um, you know, it's still a working process where um, we want these books to go out into the provincial schools. Mubasagino, not for us to just learn about you know our history. We need the uh, non-native schools to also learn about this stuff. So that's where it's going. Yeah, it's treaty education. We have to know Jaime. It's under the umbrella of the treaty education. Yeah, melody. Yeah, melody. Go go. I think I'm going to start doing it. I'm going to go. We got to get on. 
So they're going to, you know, all of this stuff is going to be um, available to all schools in Nova Scotia. Any more questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Any more questions? Mahalo, Lalio.